Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us tonight on Zoom and welcome to our online event, Rethinking the Transatlantic, the US elections and challenges to a sustainable transatlantic partnership. This evening's program, as you have just have seen, is organized by the American Academy, the German Atlantic Association and Goethe University Frankfurt. My name is Rebecca Schmidt. I'm Managing Director of the Research Center Normative Orders at Goethe University, and I'm happy to be leading you through tonight's program. Before discussing the US elections and the current transatlantic relations and the possible future with our expert panel, we will have two welcome remarks. First, I would like to welcome Professor Birgitta Wolf. Professor Wolf is president of Goethe University Frankfurt and vice president of the German Atlantic Association. She's a professor for business administration and international management. Before becoming president of Goethe University in 2015, she was serving as state minister of education and culture and also as state minister of research and economy in Saxony Anhalt from 2010 to 2013. President, welcome. President Wolf, welcome. A very warm welcome to everyone on the virtual Goethe University campus and a special welcome to President Daniel Benjamin, to President Christian Schmidt to Jürgen Trittin, former federal minister, to my colleague Nicole Deitelhoff, Rebecca Schmidt, Johannes Foltz. First of all, thanks to everyone who was invo involved in organizing this event. Um, I'm sure you did a great job and I'll be enjoying tonight's discussion with you. We are organizing this event together with the German Atlantic Association and the American Academy and the idea is um, to establish maybe even a lasting and more intensive partnership among us. Why is the US election important to us? Well, first of all, there's a connection between Goethe University, between our campus and the US, US and our special joint history as our main campus is located at the site of the former buildings of the US Army here in Frankfurt of the United States U European Command and the former headquarters of the Fifth Corps and the headquarters of the CIA in Germany. And in that very building, we still have an Eisenhower Hall until today. So there's a lot of American European history that has happened on our campus. And the second reason why um, the American elections are so significant for us is because the German-American relations remain significant for all of us. So welcome to this event and I'll be happy to listen to our panel tonight. Thank you, President Wolf. And now I would like to welcome Christian Schmidt to give his welcome address. MP Christian Schmidt is president of the German Atlantic Association, member of the German Bundestag, and the Foreign Committee. From 2014 to 2018, he served as Federal Minister of Food and Agriculture. He previously also served as Parliamentary State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry of Defense. President Schmidt, welcome. Thank you very much, Rebecca Schmidt. Thank you all uh, uh, who have started to uh, organize in this week's, uh, one of these um, very important meetings. Uh, these weeks are, are done uh, for thinking about the future of transatlantic relations. And I'm happy to have the Goethe Universität and uh, the American Academy together with the Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft uh, as um, uh, uh, the organizers there. Uh, we are uh, Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft, the German Atlantic Association is a strong uh, nonprofit organization dedicated to the mission of promoting the understanding of the transatlantic alliance as well as the politics of NATO through public discussions and so on. So we are, we are linked uh, to a lot of um, think tanks uh, as German chapter of the Atlantic Treaty Association. We have to see that um, uh, promoting the understanding of transatlantic alliance is not that easy these days because we have to think about what uh, Transic Alliance perspectives would be and will be in the next years. And it's depending a lot uh, on uh, uh, the American voters' decision. We will um, receive or probably has been made uh, 
uh, in next week. Probably have to wait some more weeks to get a very clear picture about this. But I think we have to state that there is a very high European interest and German interest in um, uh, having a, a new layer of uh, this transatlantic relations and probably understanding what we have to see from our interests as Europeans uh, in terms of not only of uh, security, of trade issues, and um, uh, of um, environmental and uh, climate change challenges. So thank you very much um, for uh, being with us today, this evening. And um, uh, if not all questions can be answered, uh, we uh, confess that we are prepared to continue this talking and this reflections over the third, November 3rd into the next year and over. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you very much, President Schmidt, for your welcome address. So let's get started. In about just one week, we will know who's going to be elected the next president of the United States. During the past four years, Donald Trump has shaped the US domestic and foreign politics. He withdrew from international agreements, questioned the NATO, described the EU as worse than China, and thus changed the transatlantic partnership by a very special way of doing politics. So everyone says this election is not only important for the future of the US domestic politics, but particularly relevant for the future relationship between the United States and its European allies. So what are we looking at tonight? What are the two scenarios for the future transatlantic relations? How do we need to rethink the transatlantic partnership? What role should the European Union play? These are the questions I would like to discuss with our expert panel now. Unfortunately, only for 25 minutes, just to let you know, um, while we can't go deeply into all of the matters, to give us a lot of space for the Q&A by our audience. And since we have 400 registrations for tonight, welcome all, and we are happy to receive your questions uh, during, the chat, uh, during the talk via the chat function. So I'm happy to introduce now our distinguished experts, starting with Ambassador Daniel Benjamin. Daniel Benjamin is president of the American Academy in Berlin. Before taking this position in summer, 2020. He was director of the John, John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College. Under President Obama, he served as ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism at the United States State Department from 2009 to 2012. Among his publications on US foreign policy, terrorism, international affairs. I will only mention his co-authored book, The Age of Sacred Tor Terror, which was awarded the Arthur Ross Prize of the Council on Foreign Relations, and his co-authored follow-up, The Next Attack, The Failure of the War on Terror and a Strategy for Getting It Right, which became Washington Post and Financial Times Best Book of the Year. Good evening and welcome, Ambassador Benjamin. Then next, please welcome with me, Professor Nicole Deichelhoff. She's Professor for International Relations and Theories of Global World Order at Goethe University. She is executive director of the Peace Research Institute Frankfurt and co-director together with Rainer Post of the U Goethe University's Research Center Normative Orders. She works on protest and contestation on international norms and institutions, theories of legitimation, authority and resistance in global politics. And as a scholar, she has received various awards for her work, just to mention the Heinz Meyer Leibniz Prize of the German Research Association, and the Shada Award. And she has, of course, published widely, specifically on this topic. I will not list the publication, otherwise I will definitely not keep in the time frame. So good evening, Professor Nicole Weichelhoff. And I'm also very happy to welcome Jürgen Trittin. Jürgen Trittin is member of the German Bundestag for Alliance 90 The Greens and currently serving as a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Furthermore, he's member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and substitute member of the Committee on the European Union Affairs. From 2009 to 2013, Jürgen Trittin was chairman of the parliamentary group of the Greens. And from 1998 to 2005, he served as federal minister for the environment, nature, conversation, conservation, excuse me, and nuclear safety under Chancellor Gerhard Schröder. 
Jürgen Trittin has given numerous talks as well has written extensively on tonight's topic. You just have to look at the last week's newspapers in Germany and is one of Germany's experts on questions of foreign policy. Good evening and welcome, Mr. Trittin. Good evening. So let's get right into the debate and start our discussion with a short view into the US domestic politics. politics. So domestic turmoil, long-standing norm, norms of liberal democracy, and even the very legitimacy of democratic elections thrown into questions is what we could observe. So everyone says American democracy is in crisis. The opening question goes to Ambassador Benjamin. Looking at all the protests, the intense polarization and a deeply divided US society, what is your analysis? Are the United States indeed facing a crisis of democracy? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And I, I want to thank uh, Professor Deitelhoff and uh, Minister Trittin for, for joining us and for and to the uh, Goethe Universität and the uh, Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft for partnering with the American Academy on this important subject. So is, uh, is there a crisis of democracy in America? Well, right now there's uh, an exuberant expression of democracy in America. People are voting literally like never before. 64 or so million people have voted thus far. People are taking their democratic responsibilities very, very seriously. I take that as a good sign. Um, do we face real challenges in a potential crisis of democracy? Um, I think uh, you would have to be foolish to say no. So um, what are the big things that could go wrong? Well, we have a president who has uh, laid the groundwork in the view of many for delegitimating the election by claiming that it is rigged. And uh, should there be um, various manifestations of that kind of effort, that is to say, if we see legislatures uh, not certifying the popular vote, uh, if we see voter suppression, if we see um, efforts to stop the counting prematurely, uh, then we will have a real uh, crisis. And if we wind up in court and find again that the um, election is being awarded to uh, the candidate who doesn't have the largest uh, percentage of the popular vote, then we will have a big problem. And we will, let me just add one more thing, and that is we face a potential uh, crisis if, uh, even if uh, President Trump wins, if he does so without winning the popular vote, because our complicated system with the Electoral College uh, means that it is possible that he could lose the popular vote by 15 million votes, according to some estimation, and still win in the Electoral College. And I think that that would be a real crisis of democracy for the United States. We've had the case that only uh, one Republican president, one Republican has won an election, uh, won the popular vote in the last seven uh, uh, elections. If that were to happen again, I think there would be uh, real um, dissatisfaction in the United States. Thank you so much. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Trittin, in an interview with Frank Veroncho, you said as well that this year's elections are not about who will be the next president, but about the very future of the US democracy. So how do you see this elections um, to be far more than Trump versus Biden? I just quoted Bernie Sanders, who said this is an election also not between Trump and Biden, it's also an election between democracy and uh, something different uh, to democracy. I'm not that optimistic, but at the end, I share the view of um, Daniel, who said that there will be a huge crisis if uh, Trump, without the majority in the popular vote, and his disrespect to institutions, uh, will try to stay in office. So therefore, the what is happening and what we are viewing, monitoring in the US is now really a comeback of democracy. A lot of people have been registered themselves. A lot of people are going to vote. And therefore, I think, yes, there is a challenge for the American democratic system, but there's also a chance to overcome um, that challenge. The second thing is beyond the outcome and the result of the presidential elections and elections in the Senate, as well as in the House of Representatives, we have a 
something from my view is, is a German uh, that is a little strange because this tough polarization, there is no real compromise between the two camps. There is nothing that bridges the polarization in the last years. Something that has been a strength of the uh, American democracy as long is now a little strange and I don't know how to overcome that system. Um, Joe Biden is looking for that, bridging that polarization, but I'm not convinced uh, that on the other side, you find pillars for building such a bridge. So the challenge for the American democracy will go up. Well, thank you very much. I would uh, love to come back to that point of uh, what Joe Biden is going to do and how that um, could influence uh, the challenges. And uh, obviously, I would like to ask Nicole Deitelhoff as a political scientist with her research focus on protests and radicalization on this topic, but I won't do that uh, now because we need to focus on tonight's major topic, the transatlantic relations and the alliances under President Trump and their possible future. So let me ask her, um, coming to our second big question of tonight on the transatlantic relations and the international uh, alliances itself. So speaking of Trump's specific attitude of communication and we could say open confrontation and well all these numerous examples like Paris Agreement, Iran, NATO and the multilateralism. Um, Professor Deitelhoff, has Trump really changed the paradigm of US foreign policy, let's say especially regarding the NATO and the other quoted examples? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I don't think that he has changed the paradigm of US foreign policy. So uh, when we say that the transatlantic partnership uh, is under stress, we usually do not refer to content or a divergence of interests because this is something that we've seen before. I mean, the US and Europe often had diverging interests, but still they would stick with their transatlantic partnership. And this is so because there is a basis of common values and interests that was stronger than these divergences. And this is where I think uh, Trump hits hard because um, it is not about leaving all these uh, agreements. I mean, this is miserable JCOA and, and so on and so forth, but I do not want to go into that. But uh, this is not about content, it is about form because a partnership or an alliance, um, it rests on a basis of common values, shared norms and interests, but also on trust trust and confidence in each other and in the alliance or in the partnership. And this is where Trump's um, administration has hit hard. That is confidence and trust is decreasing between Europe and the US. So um, you have already cited some of his um, utterances regarding the European Union or NATO as obsolete and that he doesn't you know, want to go on for years and paying too much and stuff like that. But it is, um, you do not deal with your friends, your partners, or um, your, your allies like that. You, you, you owe them respect. And this is what is missing. So there is no trust that the alliance will hold. There is no trust that the US will really stand by the Europeans with regard to um, certain goals um, for uh, world politics. And this is where I see the, the largest risks and damages that we have seen. So another four year of the Trump administration, I think that we will talk about um, the alliance as a historical period and not as an actual period. Well, anymore. That's a strong point of view and I'd like to come back uh, to that definitely. But uh, Mr. Benjamin, what do you think of Nicole Deitelhoff's analysis? That is to say, according to your opinion, what is it exactly that has changed the transatlantic partnership so profoundly from a US um, foreign expert? Well, I agree with a great deal that Professor Deitelhoff said. The uh, most profound change has been in uh, the style of uh, the uh, interaction. Uh, we've never had presidents uh, who so openly disparaged our allies before. We have had many disagreements over time and you know, the, the controversy over military spending uh, as, a, as an indicator of contribution to NATO is decades old, um, but only President Trump has made it into a, uh, a point to um, really call out and publicly humiliate um, allies. Uh, 
you know, the president is much more, this president is much more transactional than any of his predecessors and has very little um, interest in uh, long-term partnerships in which there's, you know, social capital invested. And that is uh, a distinct difference. And I think that, you know, in a, in, in a second term, uh, for better or worse, things will get, um, you know, could get a lot uh, more difficult with a possible withdrawal from NATO that can't be ruled out. And uh, the kind of hostility over trade that we have never seen uh, between uh, the Atlantic partners. So uh, I have a, a great deal of sympathy with what the professor said, and I certainly hope it doesn't come to any of those things. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Trittin. Um, how is your view on that topic? You have been describing uh, the situation using the term new global disorder. And uh, would, I would like to ask you to explain what that means for you, specifically when we are looking at the relations concerning the NATO. I think the, the crisis, and it is a real crisis in the transatlantic relation, resulted from a time long before Donald Trump. It is a result of two historic events. One was the end of the Cold War in the early 90s, and 10 years later, the overstretching of US power becoming obvious after 9-11 and the Iraq war. After that, we saw a withdrawal from the US side, beginning with George W. Bush, but later on also with the Obama administration. And this culture of global withdrawal and reorientation has been exaggerated by the Trump administration. And that's the reason. It's not new that we have conflict on the WTO or the World Bank. We have done this all had, had also this conflict. But it's the new point was that we needed, the US needed a bipartisan decision to stop Trump to leave NATO. If you would have told me in my youth that would happen, I would have said, you are crazy. It won't, won't happen at, at any time. But I think that. That's reality. And in this disruption organized uh, in the transatlantic relations, there is no simple way back to the old times of the late 90s uh, on that. So we have to look to find a new basic for that. And if you look on what I call ideals, institutions, and interests, there are some interests we have in common. For example, to have an open market. The question is, are the US still orientated in the rule of law in the international relations? I don't see this mainly from a military point of view, but also in the question, what is the core of the new Cold War that started with Trump between the US and China? It's a question, is the rule of law also a question of the economic competition between the US, China, and the US, and Europe. And there are also different interests. If you look on the results, the economic results of the corona crisis, from a European point of view, before corona, the US have been the most important export market for the European, for the German uh, industry. Now, it's China. If we come to a situation as Europeans that we should decide ourselves between China or the US on an economic question, not on a systemic question, it, it's a real complicated question. So to overcome that situation is the challenge for the next years. And that will be the real probe for a, a new transatlantic relations and overcoming the actual crisis. Well, thank you so much. Um, just a quick uh, question. I don't know if uh, any of you would like to directly reply on that. If Would you like to? Yes, please. Sure. Um, so uh, a lot of what Jürgen Trittin says is, is extremely thoughtful and incisive. Um, I would simply say that I think that there is um, always a process of creative destruction and alliances with new values and new goals 
being adopted and new ways of uh, new means of exchange between partners. And um, there are so many big issues that um, the United States uh, will want to solve and that can't be solved without Europe. Um, should we adopt a different leadership style? Should, we, um, should there be a Biden administration? So I'm actually quite confident that we can get to the point where we can rebuild that basis for cooperation, um, not only because uh, the US can't manage China by itself, uh, nor should it try, but also because we have huge interests in trade and the in, in the environment, uh, in non-proliferation, any number of different things. The basis is there for the cooperation. The question is, is um, uh, you know, getting it right and getting the willpower behind that, especially at a time when the United States has very serious internal issues to deal with. Thank you. Speaking of getting it right, let me ask the political scientist real quick again on multilateralism, which is the core uh, to this topic. So you say in one of your blog articles, who wants multilateralism has to say where and how. So please do so, uh, especially <laughs> concerning the topic just touched by Minister Chichi. How much time do I have? <laughs> like two minutes. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Um, no, what, what I wanted to say is, I mean, um, part of the implication of the stress that uh, the transatlantic uh, alliance is experiencing is that we suddenly have a debate about European sovereignty, right? And we have another debate, or not even a debate anymore, but um, even an institutional forum that's called an alliance uh, for multilateralists or of multilateralists by now. So um, is this bad for Europe? No, probably not. I mean, um, Europe finally gets its uh, things together and is trying to build something up and is trying to play a more active role in multilateralism. So um, this brings up new impulses for uh, multilateral institutions and norms. And this is, of course, important. But um, we cannot do it. I mean, Europe cannot do it alone without the US. So we need the US as a partner if we want to um, assure that basic human rights will still be valid normative regulations on the global scene, right? So um, in a way, uh, we are a little bit hamstrung. On the one hand, we cannot deal with this kind of administration, with this kind of foreign policy, with this approach to multilateralism. On the other hand, we do not have the resources, at least not now, to do it on our own. So this is a really bad situation. So as you see, in two minutes, I haven't answered your question at all, but I've added another perspective. <laughs> well, you added another perspective, and we might come back uh, to answering the, the questions. But two short follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. One uh, for Ambassador uh, Benjamin. Is it correct, and one for Mr. Trittin, is it correct that one, Daniel Benjamin, always, uh, well, stretches the role of Germany, the binational, um, the binational relations, and that Jürgen Trittin would lay a focus on the European role, not the German special pass, but the European um, approach to this topic, or is this a misunderstanding? Mr. Benjamin, would you like to go first? Uh, I'm gonna go for misunderstanding. Um, uh, I'm uh, in Germany and I'm talking about Germany and the US-German relationship is absolutely vital. Uh, but, you know, um, over uh, 75 years, the creation of a uh, more unified and coordinated Europe was uh, um, an avowedly American goal. And uh, I'm quite sure that uh, future American administrations uh, will share that goal because the United States really needs a strong partner in terms of global affairs. There's no other way around it. Germany is absolutely essential. Um, but not necessarily sufficient. We need, we need Europe. Um, and um, I, I'm not talking just for myself. Uh, uh, I really do believe that that is a widely held uh, view among um, uh, most uh, uh, American policymakers on, on both sides of the aisle. And uh, you know, the question is, how do we all, again, get it right? Okay, um, then for Jürgen uh, Trittin uh, again, you've always advocated for Euro Europe's um, sovereignty and not for the German path. So did I understand that correctly? And that's, you see the biggest- correct, because Germany is 
not big enough uh, for bringing the power in, in that game. Well, Inside the European Union, Germany may be more essential as Malta. That was the first one I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, in, in reality, uh, and that is something Donald Trump better understood as Mrs. Merkel long time believed on that. Uh, we, as an internal market, are nearly half a billion people, mm -hmm. and we are comparable to the market of the US and comparable to China. And that makes, in a system of multilateralism, the weight uh, from, for uh, the European, and therefore it's essential for Germany to understand the German foreign policy, the German's relations to China as well to the US must be a European approach. Thanks very much. Um, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I see a total uh, everybody agreeing on that. So let's come to the last uh, part of our experts panel. Two scenarios, re-election or change of government. What do you three expect? You've mentioned along uh, the discussion a few aspects, but what do you see? foresee for the future of the Paris Agreement, for a new Green Deal, for the NATO or for democracy itself. Let's say we might have a summit of democracy with Joe Biden and uh, uh, Ambassador Benjamin already mentioned that um, uh, Trump would go on questioning NATO and maybe even withdraw. So um, my question would be to all of you, what do you expect from the two possible outcomes uh, in detail? And let me quote Financial Times, FAZ and CNN that all seem to agree on one quote. There will be a radical change from Trump's approach, but more in style than in substance in case of uh, Biden's election. That would uh, resemble what Nicole Deitelhoff said about it's not about contest, but about form. So what is each of your prognosis um, with the re-election or the change of government? And how do you think do we need to rethink the transatlantic in both uh, possible situations? Um, is that a sign that Daniel Benjamin would give us a start? I'll do what I'm told. If you'd like me to take that now, I'm happy to go. Sure, I'd love to. So if the president is reelected, I think that it is a good bet that he will feel emboldened to pursue the lines of policy that he has taken thus far and to carry them even further. And so I would say that you would have to reckon with um, uh, considerable uh, antagonism across the Atlantic uh, at a minimum. Um, perhaps uh, there might ultimately be some reconciliation over the challenge of dealing with China, but that has really not been in the president's repertoire that thus far. As I said, um, you know, it would, it would take the Congress to restrain him on NATO. Um, and I think that um, we could very well see uh, a trade war. I think if um, Biden is elected, the historic American sort of turn towards Asia is not going to stop, but it will continue to involve um, a recognition that we can't do it alone and that um, uh, dealing with China uh, and especially with this extraordinary 500 million people population, democratic population uh, oriented towards free trade and, and capitalism that there would have to be some uh, effort to work together. Um, there would be, I think, an enhanced turn towards multilateralism. And I think that most of the uh, the cohort of people who would uh, join uh, President Biden um, uh, and a Biden administration very much believe that uh, such things as uh, the Paris Climate Accord, the JCPOA, the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, um, and any number of other uh, multilateral uh, um, instruments are absolutely vital towards achieving our goals. But as I said before, the United States uh, has a lot of internal issues. Jürgen Trittina is absolutely right that polarization is a hugely uh, damaging phenomenon in the United States. And we should remember that if uh, Biden is elected but doesn't win in the Senate, 
it. Although he will still have a lot of latitude on foreign policy, he will have a, a very, very difficult time uh, making progress on key issues. So America could be very divided in the future. Uh, a lot will depend on how all of the different, different elections that are uh, taking place uh, uh, come out. Right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Trittin, what is your prognosis? If, if Trump wins, the crisis will go on. The escalation will increase. I see a real danger of a trade war. Uh, I see ongoing conflicts on that. And therefore, this is the worst, worst uh, uh, alternative from a European point of view. We have to care to strengthen our own economic and political and especially financial uh, sovereignty um, and so on. The, other side, if Biden wins, there will be ongoing conflicts on international institutions on how to deal with China. But I expect, for example, uh, that uh, Joe Biden will go back to the Paris Agreement, and this will offer, for example, a chance. Europe and the US together can push on China to stop incinerate coal in, in, in that amount that they are doing, that are, they are playing, planning now. So. I see points of cooperation between both sides of the Atlantic in the case of Biden, but there will be also conflicts. Biden, a Biden administration will expect, for example, that Europe is caring for themselves on their own neighborhood. This Europe can no longer rely on the US. And that is something that will also take place with the Trump administration, but uh, it will be more complicated if it's not uh, covered by rhetoric of confrontation with the U.S., but um, as a deal with the U.S., you care on the security, for example, in Libya, and we don't care anymore. Thank you. So on many topics, I take it, let's say the climate agreement or uh, the others you have mentioned, the NATO uh, victory of Joe Biden would be, well, a good hope of, uh, yeah, um, having better relations and better understanding. But, but it's not a comfort zone for Europe. But not a comfort zone for Europe. I did take that. But let me ask in the direction of what we started with. We started with the question, is there a crisis of democracy? And Joe Biden is also planning to do something on that topic. He's uh, been um, um, publishing ideas about a summit for democracy. So is it, Nicole Deitelhoff, that also there will be a good end, not in the comfort zone, but a possibly better uh, end to discussions about democracy with Biden summit coming up? Or do you see also, well, other points to that uh, question? Well, Biden's summit, uh, global summit for democracy, he has launched this as part of his idea of reviving a multilateralism. And this is where I think it's getting a little bit dangerous, right? Because um, um, to think about multilateralism and then in the next sentence to begin with a summit of democracies that repeats a, a mistake that Western states already made in the 1990s after the end of the Cold War. I think Jürgen Trittin already referred to that. And that was this kind of liberal hubris, right? To think that one has won this Cold War and now one would rebuild the world uh, following democratic principles. And in fact, we have started a lot of wars and we have created a lot of miseries in the world. So um, this would hold or the promise of a selective multilateralism of an already discredited uh, liberal agenda. So I would certainly not suggest that we should go with this agenda. Then I would really ask for a European um, global summit of multilateralists instead of a global summit of democracies. But nevertheless, I mean, a, a part of that, I think Biden is, of course, uh, the only hope that Europe has to um, save or reinstantiate some of the agreements that we have lost during the last four years. No doubt about that. But maybe one more point. I mean, Biden is not a progressive with regard to um, climate change, right? Um, so one should not have too many hopes in, in this administration regarding climate change. 
<laughs> Indeed, I would like to ask quickly, um, because Jürgen Trittin unfortunately has to leave us a bit early uh, to, due to his schedule. So I'd like to take the chance to ask you on the ideas of a new Green Deal or yeah, this perspectives on climate uh, politics uh, again, before I will go back to our general topic. I'm, I'm not I'm not optimistic uh, on the pro progressive Biden and, and climate, mm. but in the US, you need massive investments for two reasons. One reason is to overcome the Corona crisis. This is a very, very tough task. The second thing is they have to, the US have to do a lot of investment in their own infrastructure. So from that point of view, what AOC and others call a Green New Deal is nothing else than a program to overcome the economic crisis and the weakness of the US industrial infrastructure. So this will take place, as well as with Trump, the US has invested six times more in renewable energies as Germany did. So I'm not optimistic on his progressiveness. But I think there is a real economic challenge for investment in that. And that opens a chance if he, what he promises, go, will go back to the Paris Agreement also to have a discussion with China on do they do climate protection only as a form of wording or do they really go on action and to reach really the peak of their emissions. So I think this can be a very from economic and from the ecological side, uh, side a very interesting form of cooperation between the uh, Europeans and the US. Thanks. Well, uh, Ambassador Benjamin can be quoted with that uh, the US Atlantic, well, uh, European relationship is genuinely bad at the moment, but that he's inclined to believe it's a passing phase. So an optimistic view into the future. Can I still hold you to that quote, um, Mr. Benjamin? You know, it's, um, it, it's an American um, characteristic for better or worse that we have to be optimists, so sure. <laughs> Thanks. So, well, then thank you very much for uh, the discussion we had now on the expert panel. And I would like to, that's why I've been looking to the side already. I've been uh, looking at the questions that have come in uh, through the chat. And I would like to ask you those now, but thanks for the panel uh, discussion so far. And let's uh, try to find one specifically we could ask uh, Jürgen Trittin before he has to leave us in a couple of minutes. Ah, um, well, uh, questions cannot uh, be divided uh, that much. Can you please go up again? Um, so there's general questions to start with. Um, what would be the impact of a democratic sweep of both houses of Congress and a Trump second term? Well, that's more an inner American question. So I would like to Daniel Benjamin with that. So assuming that there is no um, uh, irregularities in terms of uh, the voting and all, that is an extremely unlikely outcome. And it's been uh, looked at by the uh, polling experts. And I think they rate that as um, uh, you know, a, a one or two percent chance. Um, however, should it happen, um, I, I think that you would see um, an extraordinary level of gridlock again and paralysis and with that enormous frustration and anger in the public. And quite frankly, uh, I think that within 18 months, uh, you could well have another impeachment proceeding going on, depending on, on what happened, but uh, depending on events. But uh, uh, it would be an extraordinary set of circumstances to have a a wholly democratic Congress and uh, and the president still in office. Thanks. Here I have a remark specifically addressed to what Jürgen Trittin said about the climate politics of <laughs> Biden and not being too optimistic about it. It reads, you may be surprised what Biden will accomplish for the environment. He has embraced Jay Inslee's comprehensive plan for the environment, his life's work. 
So you should be more optimistic on that, just to, <laughs> to mention that. And I think with that, I, I can I, tell you why I'm why I have been so cautious on that, because I was in the office as a minister for environment in, in the transition period from the Clinton administration to Bush, and I had made some experiences with the Gore uh, negotiators as well as with the new team. And the difference was not that large as you sometimes would believe. We had a very, very cautious American position on uh, the Paris uh, or the, the Kyoto Agreement before and after the transition period. And therefore, I think there are good chances. Maybe uh, I should be more optimistic by it. I learned from Gramsci. It's uh, the pessimism of the intellect, but the optimism of the heart that makes you a real politician. Well, thank you very much. I think this is the best possible statement I could like. I could uh, thank you for and say uh, goodbye as you need to leave for further obligations. But thank you very much for joining us tonight and for giving us your expert opinion. Thank you, thank you very much. to be invited to this interesting discussion. Thank you very much. And let us continue on the podium with a few uh, more questions. So here we have, do you see a chance for other European countries besides Germany or France saving US-European relations in a case of a Trump re-election? Thinking of Poland or the Baltics um, having a more positive relationship. So could any other countries maybe help to change Trump's view of Europe? or the EU, Nicole Dyklov. No, I don't think so, because this is not the attitude that, that Trump has towards Europe. So um, he uses or he perceives of uh, these countries as potential um, short-term partners for um, brokering certain deals, right? Um, but he doesn't, um, he's not changed in his views about Europe or the European Union. He rather would divide the European Union even further if he has the chance to do so. I think that's the problem. Right, thanks. Um, you, you please uh, give us a sign if you want to intervene or if you want to add. Uh, well, so I would just add to that that um, you know one of the big questions is how truly European uh, a country like Poland is going to be in its dealings with the, the United States. Um, too often, this administration has pursued divide and conquer policies. Uh, but it's been enabled uh, by European countries that sometimes are prepared to emphasize the bilateral relationship over the uh, multilateral one. Right. Let's see. I think I saw another question concerning the bilateral relationship, Germany and where was that? Um, in the beginning, I think. Um, Oh yeah, this says that uh, public service suggests that President uh, Trump and the United States are so unpopular in Europe, especially uh, in Germany. And the question is, if Trump is re-elected or if Biden were to prevail, would this image problem be an obstacle to restoring the general good transatlantic relationship? Well, uh, if you want me to start, um, so, you know, the polling is devastating uh, about the, uh, um, the view of the United States right now um, from Europeans and, and, and Germans as much as anyone. And so, um, you know, polls aren't irrelevant. They tend to reflect public opinion. And I would expect that some of those sentiments would be uh, uh, expressed uh, in the Bundestag uh, and elsewhere if, um, if there's continuing dissatisfaction with US policies. Um, you know, I, we are totally interwoven economically. And if there were to be um, a trade war or something, I think that you would find an awful lot of American businesses um, really agitated about the damage uh, to the American economy. But at the same time, um, you know, it, this is it take, this is a two-sided story. And I'm quite fearful actually about how, um, how the reaction to a re-election would play out in terms of the relationship. We're interwoven not just economically, but culturally in so many other ways. 
but the reputation of the United States as demonstrated by uh, polls is really quite poor right now. Right, one another question exactly to, uh, concerning this point was, wouldn't uh, Joe Biden have to, um, how does it read? Wouldn't Joe Biden have to spend his first term completely, wouldn't uh, completely on restoring or rebuilding the relations, or as Nicole Deitelhoff said, um, well, gaining trust or confidence again. Nicole, would you like I mean, to start? Uh, so I think uh, this relates to two different dimensions, right? On the one hand, the trust among uh, political elites, that is, um, diplomats, um, foreign policy makers, and on the other hand, within the, the broader public. And the polling that Daniel Benjamin referred to is the general public. And here we see really negative effects. I mean, we always had anti-American sentiments. That's also nothing so new, but um, it has, of course, they have increased and, and they have increased dramatically. And this is something that uh, will take time and will take definitely another administration to even begin with fixing that, right? And if I if I may, because I'm looking at the questions, this um, the the. Uh, question uh, on if Trump lost and would not acknowledge Biden's victory with the result of a civil war is there also a threat to world peace? <laughs> yes. yes, there is, of course, a threat to world peace if we would see a civil war in the United States. I mean, I still I still say I cannot imagine this to happen. I think we, we, we're talking about one of the most established, most settled democracies. I cannot, I dare not to imagine that something like this could happen. But in the very, very unlikely event, I mean, yes, that would that would have certain global repercussions. Okay, then there's another one. How would Nord Stream affect the German-American relationship? Would a cancellation of the project reveal that Germany is essentially a military and diplomatic US colony? No, it would tell us something about the internationalization of uh, world economy. It means that you can have uh, certain plans and projects going on, but if you are reliant on certain supplies or uh, infrastructure, that you might not get come through with it, right? So it does not uh, uh, result in, in Germany being a US colony, but it means that Germany might not be able, even if it would like to um, finish this project, might not be able to do so. Right. Um, do you want to add something? Well, I actually wanted to just add something on the, uh, the Civil War uh, <laughs> question, only to say that um, there is a greater chance of violence between um, partisans um, associated with this election than we have seen in a long time. But we are, are you know, thousands and thousands of light years away from a civil war. And um, we have seen a small amount of really deplorable violence in the run-up to this election. I don't rule out the possibility that um, some um, individuals may want to take uh, uh, things into their own hands. Uh, I'll be the first to say we have far too many guns in the United States, um, but um, a civil war is, 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 not in, is not in the offing, thank God. Thanks. I would like to uh, take a complete different approach now. There was a question in the beginning about the role of the media of broadcasting um, with news or fake news, uh, stating that when I said in a week, we will know who's going to be the president of the United States. This is not this was not true. But in a week, we will only know who the media uh, well, pronounced to be the winner of the 2020 US elections. What do you think of that? Well, um, the, the media play an outsized role in this because when the uh, broadcasters or the Associated Press uh, declare a state for a particular candidate, uh, it, it has a profound uh, emotional impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly the 2000 election was heavily colored by the fact that um, uh, Fox News in particular, but broadcasters called Florida one way and then the other and then back, and that was um, truly disruptive. Uh, at the end of the day, it will depend on the votes. And I think it's also true that um, 
all of the broadcasters are going to be incredibly careful about um, making calls and will not do it prematurely. Um, even you know, at Fox News, which has a reputation for partisanship, the person who is in charge of this has a stellar reputation and is unlikely to do anything uh, irregular. So I'm, I'm less worried about the media than I am about a lot of other things. <laughs> well, okay, I, I do agree. What about Nicole Deichelhoff? I do agree as well, nothing to add to this. Wonderful, okay. Um, then here comes the next question. I often heard that Biden's approach to Russia is much harsher than Trump's. What actions can we expect in particular from the Biden administration and how would these actions influence the transatlantic relations? That's a very broad question, but maybe I think Ambassador Benjamin had already uh, started with an answer. Well, uh, I would only say that um, there's no question that um, a Biden admin administration will be tougher on, on Russia and the president's refusal to be tough on Russia at so many uh, junctures remains one of the great mysteries of the Trump administration. And I'm not gonna speculate anymore. Everyone has read all the news stories and all the, all the chatter about that. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to recognize uh, that the a Democratic administration um, also understands that Russia has uh, an enormous nuclear arsenal and that this is a relationship that is strangely poised between a kind of artificial friendliness embodied in Trump and Putin and free fall because there are so many issues of conflict right now. And I think US, US policymakers understand that there has to be a floor underneath this relationship, uh, even as we have many issues uh, to um, contend with the Russians about. Mm -hmm. Right. Before you answer, let me give uh, sort of a follow up. Faced with Russia and China, who are openly challenging the Western model of global order, do you really think we have enough pragmatic politicians on both sides of the Atlantic to to rescue our alliance? Well, I should have asked that to the politician, but uh, so now the political scientist and the uh, ambassador will have to answer. Nicole, do you like to go first? Yeah, I can do that. I mean, um, the political scientists will give a political answer that is hope dies last, right? So um, I, yeah, of course. I mean, if, if you, looking at you into the foreign policy um, establishment of the United States, I see many pragmatic politicians and decision uh, makers. So I, I think there is potential. The question is when we have a Biden administration, will he hire the right people? I'm quite confident uh, with regard to that. If, we, if you're looking at the Trump administration, what we have seen is that many strategically vital positions with regard to foreign policy have been vacant or have, well, have been, um, Ah, no, that's not that's not politically correct. What I would say now, but but I think so. Uh, I have the hope that there are really there are brilliant, brilliant foreign foreign policy experts and diplomats on the U.S. side, and I'm I'm very much in hope that they will take the seat. Do you take the uh, same side? Well, naturally, um, there there's a lot of talent uh, in the U.S., and in fact, there's a lot of talent in the traditional. Uh, Republican foreign policy uh, uh, coterie uh, group uh, that may also get called upon. There are a lot of talented foreign policy people. The challenge uh, is going to be to balance the domestic and the foreign on the one hand, and to just deal with such an enormous number of problems that have accumulated in the midst of a pandemic, okay? This is not something that can you know easily be done the challenges are going to be tremendous yeah. well thanks this is a question specifically addressed to you mr benjamin if biden and the democrats were to win do you see a chance to replace the outdated strange electoral system with a democratically based proportional representation system since you mentioned the uh, specialties of the u.s election system in the beginning uh, unfortunately, uh, recent uh, experience shows that it is virtually impossible to have the constitutional amendments necessary to um, get rid of the uh, Electoral College. I would be very surprised if America ever opted for proportional representation. It's absolutely not in keeping 
with our two-party system and with the way our institutions are arranged, I could see um, I could see us doing away with the electoral college, and I could also see an alternative approach, which is that lots of states are increasingly taking a pledge that they will um, vote, that they will delegate their electors in the electoral college only for the winner of the popular vote, which is um, a new innovation. Um, but it is almost impossible to change our constitution now. And because of polarization, because uh, the Republican Party has such an enormous investment in the Electoral College, very hard to see how this changes anytime soon. And um, I have another one. As the relationship between Europe and the US increasingly, increasingly tends to shift to a realismous relationship, what does it mean for the European military and especially the German military? Is it necessary to increase money and resources into the military sector? Or in Germany, what would the political scientists say to that? Uh, well, the political scientists would say there's a lot of money and resources in this sector. And first of all, we have to check whether all money and resources um, are spent for the right thing. So we have to increase efficiency of public spending in this sector. And uh, second, my second part of the answer would be yes, of course. I mean, we are we are talking about European sovereignty, and this also means a European Union a defense or a European Defense Union, and that will necessarily mean to increase resources and spending for the military to allow for an interoperational um, defense system. Right. And uh, Mr. Benjamin, could you please explain the role of the Supreme Court in case of a close or even a contested election result? Would it become the ultimate decision maker? And how um, it, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be the ultimate decision maker. According to our constitution, um, in the case where neither, pres neither candidate gets uh, sufficient electoral votes, the uh, contest is thrown into the Congress and specifically the House of Representatives. It, it is possible, however, that the Supreme Court, as it did in 2000, would play a very important role in determining the outcome of conflicts over uh, vote counts in uh, different states. And I think that that would be a huge mistake. The Supreme Court uh, saw that its reputation was terribly tarnished after 2000. Uh, so I think it, it really would like to stay out of this. Um, on the other hand, it will have to see how the politics uh, evolve. Um, but uh, it should not wind up in court. Whether it does, we'll have to see. Okay, thanks. And uh, here I have one question about the uh, deeply divided US uh, society. So if we are so divided internally, how can there possibly be a strong transatlantic alliance again? Shall I take a stab at that first? So, and uh, Nicole needs, uh, will ha needs to answer to that as well, of course. <laughs> well, so um, first of all, much of the Congress, uh, I think, is still um, dedicated to a, a strong transatlantic relationship. And if... Um, uh, if Biden should come to office, even if the Democrats don't win the Senate, I think that this would be an area in which there would be relatively little friction. There would be a big problem in that domestic affairs would, domestic issues would uh, eclipse uh, foreign uh, policy issues. If we remain a very divided country, as I fully expect we will, and the Democrats uh, control both houses of Congress, uh, they will do their best and the country will do its best to have a unified um, uh, solid foreign policy uh, that I'm sure will include uh, strengthening anew the transatlantic uh, relationship. If uh, President Trump is reelected, then I foresee a lot of internal division and it will be very difficult to uh, reestablish the relationship. Mm -hmm. Nicole, that of you're working closely on the field of social cohesion recently. So what would you uh, say to that? The thing I would say is that um, a, a division or, or social cohesion is not directly related to foreign policy, right? So that's the first thing. And um, polarization in the uh, US American society has not started with Trump. It's also a long-term development. And as long as the foreign policy establishment 
is in its majority uh, in favor of uh, um, a strong transatlantic alliance, I do not see any damaging effects. But if the foreign policy lead, and particularly if there is an administration that is not in favor of a transatlantic alliance, that is that is continuing its attack on these alliances, and, um, and, and, and yeah, humiliating its its transatlantic partners, then there will be massive damages, as I um, already said at the outset. Well, uh, thanks so much for answering to those questions. But let us um, close with your final remarks. How to rethink, sort of as a, a summary, how to rethink the transatlantic and what would be your standpoint, your advice uh, on that? Ambassador Benjamin? Well, um... You know, uh, there was a famous conversation once between President Kennedy and, uh, and the English uh, British Prime Minister uh, Macmillan, uh, in which Kennedy was very young, new in office, and said, um, "What what is the biggest challenge that you have faced?" And Macmillan said, looked at him, you know, like a very experienced person, and said, "Well, events, dear boy, events. So everything is going to depend upon events." Mm -hmm. If we have the best outcome uh, imaginable in terms of the transatlantic relationship, um, let me just answer that one possibility. I think that uh, I would say two things. One is that, um, and we've said this many, many uh, elections before, Europeans should not expect that everything will snap back like a rubber band that has lost none of its shape or elasticity. There will still be issues to work through. We may have an issue, for example, on Iran, with, where the U.S. has been out of the Iranian nuclear deal for all these years, and the U.S. may ask for more assurances. Right. I would not necessarily favor that, but that could happen. So there's going to have to be a uh, relationship of um, you know, cooperation, mutual trust, and an effort to help each other out in some very difficult political situations. That's the first thing. The other thing is that I think that uh, Europeans have a great deal to offer in terms of um, uh, helping uh, a new administration focus on priorities and figure out where to um, uh, where to identify uh, hurdles that need to be overcome to come to cooperative policies. And uh, I think there's a, a lot of room for uh, uh, cooperative work there. I also think that there is an understanding among many Americans who may play a role in the next administration that Europe is essential and that uh, Europe uh, is really a, a key to solving a lot of the problems that we face together. Again, uh, you only need to look at the environment to have the most outstanding uh, uh, example. So, um, you know, I hope that there will be some recognition of the situation that, uh, 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 that the United States comes back to the table uh, in and, uh, and a real effort of uh, friendship and, and uh, common cause to solve those problems. Thank you so much, Professor. The final I think word. no matter who wins the election, what we will see is a more flexible partnership and a more narrow partnership. So we'll maybe focus on the remaining converging interests where, where both sides have the feeling that they can gain from agreement, from cooperation, but it will not be this kind of, a, we, we, we usually call it the security community, right? And I think this is something that, that might already be part of the past and that we will um, have to face a more flexible partnership in the future, more narrow. Wonderful, thank you very much. At this point, looking at the time, we will unfortunately have to close our discussion with lots of interesting questions still waiting to be asked. Thank you so very much, our dear panelists, Ambassador David Benjamin, Professor Nicole Dykloff, and of course, uh, Minister Jürgen Trittin for sharing your great expertise with us tonight. Thank you all, our audience, very much for joining us tonight and participating intensively with your questions. And last but not least, let me take the chance to uh, send thanks again to the three organis organizing institutions. I would like to uh, convey special thanks to Dr. Berit Ebert, American Academy, Elisabeth Zirkenido, German Atlantic Association, and Johannes Pölz, Heisenberg Professor of American Studies at Goethe University Frankfurt for setting up the panel and many thanks also to Mareike Klaus American Academy for the organization. In seven days, I'd say it again, um, we will, shall know the outcome 
taken aside the media discussion yeah, of the historical 2020 US elections. And we are looking forward to staying in touch with our experts and you all through further events as President Schmidt mentioned. So also on behalf of President Wolf, thank you all very much. Goodbye and good night from Goethe University in Frankfurt.